coming up on The World Today. History in the making for U.S. President Joe Biden and Russian President Vladimir Putin as they meet in Geneva for talks. The Ukrainian police uncover a group of hackers that carried out a ransomware attack on foreign companies and universities in 2019. Plus, joint ceasefire between Israel and Gaza now in jeopardy as Israel carries out airstrikes in Gaza overnight, following the Palestinian launch of incendiary balloons. Well, that is the moment we have all been looking forward to, the whole world watching us as U President, U.S. President Joe Biden and Russian President Vladimir Putin meet in front of the villa entrance, shaking hands before going in to begin their summit, expected to last hours. A warm welcome to our viewers here in Nigeria and around the world. Thanks for joining us. I'm Akaite Afia. We are learning that both presidents have wrapped up a second round of talks. The Russian president has been described as appearing more comfortable, more confident, and relaxed in the opening part of their summit in Geneva. At least that's what Russian press is reporting. They also say the U.S. president appeared a little more shackled, with a feeling that he's not quite comfortable in his chair. Body language experts, however, say the two leaders exude strong executive presence, authority, and gravitas, but with two very different approaches. We try to determine where we have mutual interests and we can cooperate. And where we don't establish a predictable and a rational way in which we disagree. So we are learning that the summit is now over, according to White House officials. The official meeting lasted just more than three hours, broken into two rounds, and both are set to hold separate news conferences. Expectations for the summit were low among American officials, who have said since the last encounter, that they did not think anything concrete would emerge from it, and that instead that the U.S. president is looking to open lines of communication with the Russian president in hopes of stalling further deterioration in relations between the United States and Moscow, which he, Joe Biden, said last week reached a low point. Just before going into their meeting, both leaders had expressed hopes that the Geneva summit would be productive. Our Washington correspondent, Maria Bird, joins us now for more on this. Maria, thanks for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me. So the meetings are over now. They held in two parts. Do we have any idea what items were discussed and if expectations were met? Well, we know that there were items discussed, obviously, cyber attacks. Cyber attacks and what we've been seeing with the ransomware in the U.S. was obviously the top of areas of discussion for specifically President Biden um, and uh, Russian President Putin as well. And so those talks occurred. We also know that there were talks about a swapping of prisoners war prisoners. And so those prisoners swapping, I know, is going to be further conversation around that um, with the foreign ministers um, in Russia and also the State Department in the U.S. And so those issues were not necessarily resolved. Um, obviously, some of the global challenges that are faced, um, and I think there was, you know, even some personal discussions that were held and talking about their families and really being able to get an idea as to the type of men that each of them were. So, 
I think that from what uh, the U.S. was expecting, as you said, there was not a very high barometer um, on what was expected to be discussed, but I think it was an opening of the door um, for those that were able to see uh, Russian pre President Putin's uh, press conference. Um, it was very clear that he felt that this was the beginning, and he said, no, there was not an invitation to the White House, which goes to tell you they're not quite at that point yet. But they are at a point where they are able to at least begin discussions to be able to move the relationship forward. Okay, well, we will be eventually putting up the live feed that the Russian president. Maria, so I wanted to ask you another question there. There was a lot of anticipation about the moment when both leaders met. And news media in Russia and the United States have been analyzing body language between the two. So can you talk to us about whether or not and also how that may have been translated into today's talks? You know, I think there has to be a clear, you know, indication that both sides were probably nervous. I mean, this is the first time in quite some time that the U.S. and Russia, um, outside of uh, former President Trump, have had a real conversation in a very formal setting. Um, we know that they've asked for the return of the ambassadors to the various posts in Russia and in the U.S. And so when you're at that very infancy state where you're even talking about having a reopening of many of the embassies and having ambassadors returning, to their post, um, it, it just goes to show you that this was not an easy conversation on e either end. And knowing that there could have been security issues and security breaches that could have occurred. And so, yes, the body language, I think, is one to look at. But I think we must note, too, that they were probably both very nervous. And this was the first real meeting um, for President Biden. Yes, he's a longtime professional politician, but he has never been president before. Well, that, that is definitely true. And we do actually have live feed from Geneva right now, which is President Vladimir Putin has been answering questions for the last 30 minutes following his talks with President, U.S. President Joe Biden. And Joe Biden is expected to also be holding his own press conference answering questions as well. And Maria, I want to ask you another question here. While we're waiting on both of them to finish their or to finish giving their press conferences, I imagine that American journalists have a lot to ask the president. So what are you hearing in regards to what is the most pressing issue or what it is that was not addressed in the summit? The pressing issues are going to be, yes, we see that there's not an escalation of you know conflict. But what was done beyond just having a nice conversation and being able to say we'll begin to work together? I think that Americans were looking for some clear answers. I think Americans have been wanting to have this conversation with Russia from a very strong standpoint since the 2016 elections. I think Americans are very, very um, you know, worried about and concerned about the potential cyber attacks and the meddling of our elections uh, from Russia. So I think there was some hope that that real answer would have occurred and that some sort of a resolution would have been made in that area. And so um, I think Americans are going to be also looking to see if, you know, there's several individuals that are held in prison in Russia. When are they going to release? Not just a conversation about a potential swapping, but when will the release happen? Well, I think we'll definitely be waiting to hear some answers to those questions. Maria, thanks so much for joining us on the program today. Thank you for having me. Turning to the Ukraine now, where police say that they have uncovered a group of hackers who had carried out ransomware attacks on foreign companies and universities between 2019 and 2021. Six hackers had targeted the servers of U.S. and South Korean companies, threatening to disclose confidential data if the victims did not pay up, according to a police statement. The total damage inflicted amounted to $500 million. The total of 21 searches on the homes and vehicles of the alleged hackers were conducted, according to police. They did not say whether any of the suspects had been detained. Staying in Europe, the South Korean president, Moon Jae, in today has addressed the Spanish Senate on the second day of his visit to the country. Earlier, he had met with Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Santos at Moncola Palace for bilateral talks, where agreements between the two countries were later signed. Sanchez and Moon addressed the deep and extensive bilateral relations 
especially in the economic, commercial, and investment fields, and have confirmed that both countries could expand their collaboration on renewable energy, infrastructure, and sustainable food issues. President Moon has described the partnership between Spain and South Korea as strategic. Meanwhile, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has rejected the opposition's assertion that delaying imposing travel restrictions aided the spread of the more Thank contagious you, Delta Speaker. variant of COVID-19 across the UK. Mr. Speaker, does the, Prime the variant like first identified in India is Please believed to spread more easily than other variants and is now the most prevalent strain in the country. In response to opposition leader, Labour leader Keir Starmer's question as to whether Britain's border policy helped the variant gain a foothold in Britain, Johnson said the government put India on the most severe of its three-tier restriction system, well before the strain was identified. Uh, no, Mr Speaker, I think that uh, Captain Hindsight needs to adjust his retro, his retro spectroscope because he's completely wrong. Uh, 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 we put India, we put India on the red list, Mr. Speaker, on April, on April the 23rd, uh, and the Delta variant was not uh, so identified until April uh, the 28th, uh, Mr. Speaker, and was only identified as a variant of concern on May the 7th, uh, Mr. Speaker. When he criticises this government for wanting to keep our borders open, just remember that he voted 43 times in the last five years, Mr Speaker, to ensure that our border controls were kept in the hands of Brussels, Mr Speaker. Oh, Keir Starmer. Oh, Mr Speaker, this is absurd. The International Criminal Court has sworn in British barrister Karim Khan as new prosecutor, an outsider who cut his teeth as a top international defense lawyer. The 51-year-old Khan, who starts today, inherits probes opened in hotspots like the Palestinian territories, Afghanistan, Myanmar, and the Philippines by outgoing prosecutor Fatou Bensouda. Already short of resources, the International Criminal Court is dealing with 14 full-blown investigations and eight preliminary examinations. Khan will be closely watched as he takes on investigations opposed by powerful non-member nations such as Israel, the United States, and Russia. Raise your right hand and in accordance with Article 45 and Rule 5 of the Rules of Procedure. I, Kareem Assad Ahmed Khan, solemnly undertake that I will perform my duties and exercise my powers as prosecutor of the International Criminal Court honorably, faithfully, impartially, and conscientiously, and that I will respect the confidentiality of investigations and prosecutions. The Israeli army has carried out airstrikes in Gaza overnight after Palestinians reportedly launched incendiary balloons from the territory in the first major flare-up since an 11-day conflict last month. The Israeli military said it targeted compounds belonging to Hamas, the militant group that controls Gaza. The incendiary balloons sparked 20 fires in southern Israel on Tuesday. Hamas said they were a response to a march by Israeli nationalists in occupied East Jerusalem. There were no casualties on either side, and calm has been restored. Meanwhile, Israeli troops today shot a Palestinian motorist who tried to ram them in the occupied West Bank and then brandished a knife, according to the military and Palestinian officials. She said that... She has been killed. The incident comes amid increased tensions after a Jewish nationalist march in Jerusalem on Tuesday drew the launch of incendiary balloons across the Gaza border and retaliatory Israeli airstrikes. The military said the Palestinian woman, quote, attempted to ram into a number of IDF or Israeli Defense Forces soldiers near the Palestinian village of Himsma, northeast of Jerusalem. The Palestinian Health Ministry said the woman died of her injuries. There was no word of Israeli casualties. Still to come on the program. Indonesian authorities trying to get people interested in COVID-19 vaccinations offer an incentive. Stay with us.
Thanks for staying with us. The UK is still discussing the likelihood or unlikelihood that COVID restrictions will be lifted at the set date and appear to be favoring an extension of restrictions by four weeks. Here's the global update. Johnson & Johnson is set to deliver 2 million COVID-19 vaccine doses to South Africa by the end of the month. As Pen Pharmacare, J&J's local producer had to get rid of 2 million doses of the vaccine after a contamination was discovered at a U.S. plant. Massive surge in new infections means that we must once again tighten restrictions on the movement of persons and gatherings. New York's governor, Andrew Cuomo, announced the lifting of most COVID-19 restrictions and celebrated the good news by lighting up the skyline with fireworks. Amidst the celebration, tough times are still ahead as New York City combats a historic rise in streets homelessness during pandemic recovery. Most U.S. states have moved to ease or lift COVID-19 restrictions. And in the UK, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson rejects the opposition's assertion that delaying imposing travel restrictions aided the spread of more contagious Delta variant of COVID-19 across the UK. Mr Speaker, does the Prime Minister recognise that his decision to keep our borders open contributed to the spread of the Delta variant in this country? No, Mr Speaker, I think that... Uh Captain Hindsight needs to adjust his retro, his retro spectroscope because he's completely wrong. In Moscow, authorities are making vaccination compulsory for public workers. A decree named a range of jobs, from hairdressers, retailers, taxi drivers to bank tellers, teachers and performers. And finally, the French Prime Minister announces an end to the country's night curfew. As he says in his words, the health situation of our country is improving faster than we had hoped. The curfew will not end from June 20, as opposed to a previous June 30 target. An Indonesian town is rewarding elderly residents with live chickens for getting vaccinated for COVID-19 after the initial inoculation campaign saw a low turnout from the public. Authorities show up at elderly residents' homes without prior notice, prepared to hand out vaccines and chickens at a new door-to-door -door vaccination drive in Sipanas district of West Java province. Local authorities said it has been quite difficult persuading elderly residents to get vaccinated due to existing fears towards the vaccine. Sipanas aims to have 60,000 residents fully vaccinated by the end of July. So far, only 2,500 residents have received at least one vaccine dose since January of this year. Still in Indonesia, Indonesia's Meteorology and Geophysics Agency is warning of possible aftershocks and tsunami potential after a 6.1 magnitude earthquake hit near the Maluka Islands, also known as the Maluka Islands. The agency had initially said the quake, which struck at a depth of 10 kilometers, had no tsunami potential, but later said a tsunami wave could potentially be triggered by underwater landslides. Although some buildings and public facilities have sustained damage, officials say there is no immediate report of casualties so far. However, the agency is still monitor monitoring the situation. In Nepal, seven people are missing after heavy rains triggered floods. Nepal Home Ministry official Dil Kumar Tamang said seven people were missing after overnight rains in Sindhupal Chok district, which borders the Tibet region of China, triggered flash floods in the Melachami River, inundating dozens of homes. Witnesses said several people in Melamchi had moved to higher grounds with their belongings while army helicopters were rescuing those trapped in marooned houses. 
Nepal and Bhutan have been lashed by heavy rains in the last three days as the annual monsoon season begins. In the arid mountains of southern Morocco, women harvest argan oil, a natural product they have been long used in cooking, but which was become highly priced by the global beauty industry as an anti-aging skin treatment and restorative for hair. Most argan oil is produced by local cooperatives of Amazigh-speaking Berber women around the cities of Ag Agadir, Eswaria, and Tower Dent, where the argan tree, which bears small green fruit resembling an olive, is common. For centuries, the oil among, is among the most expensive in the world, has been extracted by drying argan fruit in the sun, peeling and mashing the fruit, then crushing and grinding the kernel with stones. The oil was traditionally used as a flavoring and savory dip for bread. As an ingredient, it is still common in Morocco and now also exported for food. Well, that is all we have for the program today. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Akaite Afia. Have a great evening and stay safe.